Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us again. Um, for those who didn't see our first video, this is Dr. Tara Carr with me today. She is a biological dentist in the Twin Cities area. So thank you so much for joining me again today, Dr. Carr. Um, just off the bat, how are you doing today? I know that it's been kind of a crazy time for people. Well, thank you for having me back. This is really exciting for us to collaborate on these very awesome topics that I'm very passionate about. And I think it, it just really is important to bring oral health into the whole body health. So I really appreciate you inviting me back. I think that's great. I'm doing great. Um, it's a wacky world in Minnesota today. And <laughs> yesterday and the day before we've had some snow. So that's a little crazy and my body's in shock about winter. But other than that, I'm great. Everything is going really well on this end. Uh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, it was, we had some weird thunder snow where yeah. I'm at this morning, which was interesting. <laughs> very strange, very strange year. 2020 just continues to amaze, right? I know, right. It's very, know. it's very unique. Yeah. Um, so anyway, for those of yeah. you who missed our last conversation, Dr. Carr and I really focused a lot on um, basically prenatal and conception, children's health, like babies, oral health, stuff like that. And today we're going to move into talking a little bit more about conventional dentistry versus biological dentistry, a little bit more as a whole. So my big question to start off for you, Dr. Carr, is if you could just talk to us a little bit about the difference between the materials used in conventional dentistry versus biological dentistry and what issues we see arising from some of the more conventional materials? Sure, it's a great question. And it's a question that I would say 99% of the patients that come to our practice ask, right? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the difference and what is biological dentistry? So just to backtrack a little bit. So, you know, conventional dentistry is really, I think of it as like tooth carpentry, right? So you come in, you have a hole in your tooth, you have a problem, the dentist fixes it up. They don't give you really much choice. They tell mm -hmm. you what they're going to do. Right. They don't disclose anything that they're doing as far as what the material is or a lot of that. And so, you know, they just go in and they fix the hole in your tooth and they're not really looking at your whole body, why that happened, you know, what's going on, how to prevent that in the future. So biological dentistry really looks at the individual, okay, and what is compatible and what is disruptive for that particular mm -hmm. individual. And, um, you know, so we have a whole, um, our tool, our toolkit is very big because we use lots of different materials in our practice versus a conventional dental practice because everyone is so individual. So a big one that comes up is dental amalgam, right? Mm -hmm. so this is the silver filling, the traditional silver filling. And, you know, there's a lot out there. Most people understand now that there is mercury in these fillings. So it's over 50% mercury. There's also tin, copper, and zinc in these silver fillings. And so mercury is a heavy metal and mm -hmm. heavy metals are extremely toxic. They are um, neurotoxins is their main thing. So they affect the brain and the neurology, the nerves of the body. And they work synergistically. So if you have, say, a, an exposure to a little bit of lead, and then you have an exposure to a little bit of mercury, the two of those together is exponential. So it can really create a lot of disruption in the body. And again, everyone different, has different levels of sensitivity to this. So we have tipping points. So some people can handle more toxic burden. Their body can mm -hmm. detox it and you know, they can, they can get rid of it. And it's not as much of a factor for leading you down the path to chronic illness and, and imbalance. For other people, it's a teeny tiny amount that tips the scale for them. And now they really have some serious issues going on. So dental amalgam is one thing. And that's one of the things that they, that conventional dentists still place. They still place it in pregnant women, in children, um, adults, you know, they place it in everyone. Now yeah. the FDA actually just came out within the last month stating that they are making recommendations that dental amalgam is not placed into anyone with kidney dysfunction, mm -hmm. pregnant or children under the age of six. So this is a huge step forward, huge step yeah. forward. 
Um, and hopefully it will open up the conversation a bit around the toxicity of this particular material. Yeah, that I'm so glad that that's you. Did you say it was a no, it was an FDA recommendation yes. that just came out, right? right. So, yep. so exciting that that came out because it yes. is like, it just kind of blows your mind that, you know, we know that we know that these are heavy metals and we right. are putting them very Next purposely in right into a part of our body that's very close to our brain even yeah. so it is something that you know we do have a lot of patients come into our office to see dr rob who are dealing with issues stemming yes. from heavy metal and i think it's really interesting that you pointed out too that it is synergistic so if you have um that filling and you're exposed to a heavy metal elsewhere, which mm -hmm. is there everywhere, right? It's yep. everywhere. It's very yep. common that yep. that could, you know, be an exponential yes. problem. So yep. very important that we start focusing on using something that is better for you as an individual in those Absolutely. fillings. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's two other things I'll say about this. It's a huge topic and we can go into just dental amalgam where there's a ton of information on my website too about that. But mm -hmm. um, one thing is that if we have overgrowth of yeast in our body or we have some sort of parasite in our body, they will actually bind up the heavy metals. So they actually take in the heavy metals and I'm not quite clear as to how they metabolize them or why they do that, mm -hmm. but somehow they do that. And so then when you detox, right? So if you clear a parasite or you go through a yeast cleanse, now you're releasing all of that heavy metal into the body again, pushing it through the bloodstream, you know, through the kidneys and, and coming out that way. So when you do a detox, if someone has a mouthful of metals, or if you're trying to get rid of a parasite, it's really important to understand that you know, if, you're, if your client or patient is getting sick or having kind mm -hmm, of like, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of healing crisis, you know, it could actually be have a heavy metal toxicity that's happening. So oh, wow, that's I always find point. that very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing is that these metals, so this would be any dental metal, and we'll talk a little bit more about crowns and partial dentures and implants and things like that. But any sort of metal, dental metal in the mouth is actually going to create a galvanic current. So this is an electrical current. So mm -hmm. if we have mercury, which is a metal, and we have copper, which is a metal, and they're amalgamated together in an oral environment, which is wet with electrolytes, you get like a battery effect. So you get ions, electrons bouncing back and forth and exchanging between these metals. When that happens, it creates this electrical stimulus. Mm -hmm. And again, for some people, that can be very disruptive to the brain and to the nervous system. Yeah. So this galvanic effect is a very potent and very important part when we're looking at you know, removing metals from people's mouths and from their bodies. <clears throat> yep. So I do have a quick yeah. question, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, just with hearing that and, you know, growing up being someone who had braces, is that yes. also something yes. that would be of concern then? It is. Now with braces, I'm not as concerned. There are ways we can test the, the wires and the brackets for mm -hmm. individuals that might have more of a, a preponderance to be sensitive to those metals, okay. um, but they're temporary. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's not something that you're going to be having in your body for 10, 20, 30 years. Right. Um, right. So, and then the wires themselves are changed, right? So, you know, you, you have a specific wire that's doing something that's banded in and then yeah. they take that wire out and they put a new wire in. So we're not seeing some of the same corrosive um, okay. byproducts that we see with some of the dental metals that are in the mouth for a long time. And, um, but there is a concern and there are some people definitely that it is not, you know, it's not a, a, a supportive thing to mm -hmm. have going on in your body. Mm -hmm. And luckily now we have other options like Invisalign. So this would be a perfect right. springboard into something that we offer. Now, a lot of conventional dentists will offer Invisalign as well, but it's basically a clear aligner system. So you're getting an orthodontic orthopedic movement, but you're mm -hmm. not using metals to do it. Yeah. Now that's plastic and there's concerns <laughs> See, with plastics, right? Right. It's like, you know, what, how can we find an actual 
Right. Will we ever find something that's actual, completely okay right. to put into completely our bodies? Cool. But I do think that, you know, that's really where people like Dr. Rob can mm -hmm. come into play where he does that testing on individuals to see if their body reacts to those specific materials. So being able to have the patients come in, get tested and see what is the best option for them as an individual, as someone who is completely unique. And that is exactly what I advocate for because I cannot tell you, you know, how important it is that it's not one size fits all, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, what I, my body might accept and what, what might be the best option for me could be totally the wrong thing for you. So, right. I mean, I am confident in saying you don't want a dental amalgam, right? Like I'm not right. going to yeah. place that, right? But as far as composites or ceramics or these other non-metal, you know, supposedly more inert, biologically friendly materials, mm -hmm. people can still be very reactive. So let's talk about composite. I think that's important. Yeah. So these are these bonded fillings, right? So the tooth color, colored bonded fillings. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. They're a very um, easy, not easy, I would say quick procedure to have done. Mm -hmm. And they're very conservative. So I don't have to remove a lot of healthy tooth in order to place that sort of filling material. The caveat to this material is it's not simply, you know, it's not inert. So it's plastic, right? right? And with plastics, we have concerns about this GMA, right? And this off-gassing and this chemical process. Um, and then there's, you know, the, there's other, like the BIS, the BIS GMAs, and then there's other things that are the precursors to that, that once the filling itself is cured, it will release these BPAs and other things. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, it's not perfect, right? Right. But for most people, it is a better option than the heavy metal. I mean, mm -hmm. I would say in almost everyone. Right. And yeah, probably also a better option than the alternative of what happens if we don't. Yes, exactly. You know, fix if we're not something. treating it. Right. right. Exactly. So, so that's kind of the concern about the, the composite fillings is that they do have this plastic chemistry. They, you know, some of them, a lot of them have these BPAs in it. Mm -hmm. They, they're, they are more tooth friendly. So the metal fillings, like the dental um, amalgam, it's really rigid. And so when you bite and function on it, it can actually create cracks and fractures in the tooth. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people that have had a silver filling in their mouth for 30 years, they bite down on something and their tooth breaks and now they need a crown, right? Or yeah. something like a cap that goes over the whole tooth. So those metal fillings can be functionally disruptive as well. The composite filling is much more friendly in kind of reestablishing the structural integrity of the tooth. They're a little bit flexible, so they're not creating that wedging effect. Mm -hmm. And they do tend to be um, easier on the tooth from that integrity kind of functional perspective. But they wear out faster. So you yeah. know, the average length of this type of filling is like seven to 10 years. So if we're drilling into your tooth every seven to 10 years, every time we do that, you have an increasing risk that there could be some complication, some unresolved inflammation in the tooth or mm -hmm. some tooth death at some point. So yeah. again, it's not perfect, right? Right. And I think all of that really highlights kind of going back to our first conversation together, just how important it is to, for parents to be aware yes. of, you know, how what you're doing even before you conceive is going to be impacting your child's oral health. And then just keeping in mind how to raise children with good oral health, how to take care of your own oral health as an adolescent, as a teenager, you know, as you throughout your lifespan, just to decrease the need for these things. Absolutely. And I think I can't, I can't, overemphasize that. That is just mm -hmm. crucial and critical to having overall healthy body, right? But mm -hmm. having a healthy mouth and not having to go down the path of having dental restorations placed and replaced yeah. and, and going down that path. So yes, it's very important. But as an adult who maybe didn't have the opportunity, right. you know, you know, I always go back to whole body health. So if we see breakdown or we have maintenance we have to do in the mouth, it's very important to fix that. Absolutely. 
but we also want to dive into, well, why did this happen? Mm -hmm. Is there clenching and grinding? Is there, you know, is the body chemistry off? Is the gut health off? Is there some sort of underlying systemic chronic inflammation that's going on? Is yeah, there, there nutrient deficiencies? Right. So, you know, as adults, it can get trickier to kind of unravel that braid as to mm -hmm. why, you know, why am I here? Why is this happening? Every time I come in, I have a cavity or now all my teeth are breaking or, you know, right. whatever it happens to be. So, yeah. So if you don't mind me asking, what yeah. are some of the more common issues that you are seeing in, I mean, do you see a difference in issues between, you know, your older adults versus your middle-aged adults versus your young adults right now, just like as dentistry and what we are learning evolved and how each of those um, demographics might have differed in the way they cared for their teeth growing up. Definitely. So, you know, I see, I basically see a dichotomy, right? Uh -huh. So I see on one side, super healthy babies and kids that grow up to be super healthy adolescents who grow, grow up to be super healthy young adults and, and on into their lifetime, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that is very common these days. I do have a, a big section of the population of my practice where I am seeing that because there's this higher IQ and this advocacy for, you know, autonomy over what's going yeah. into your body and, you know, keeping the body healthy, really working preventatively to set the child up for success. Mm -hmm. Then I see the other side. Okay. So I see the babies that have gut imbalance or have obstructive sleep apnea or have food sensitivities or detox pathway issues, you know, until that stuff gets corrected, you're just going to continually see issues with mm -hmm. the mouth. And when we start putting fillings in babies when they're two, you know, that, you know, it's, it, it can be quick to correct it in some mm -hmm. cases if you catch it early enough. But the longer that goes on, the more difficult it is to sort it out. And parents are busy and they don't always have yeah. a lot of extra money around, right. particularly if they have multiple children. And so it can be really tricky to say, hey, yeah, we've got to fix your teeth. But then the more, almost more important issue is you got to figure out what's going on with the whole body. You know, yeah. so I see those two sides. And when we have those babies that at two years old, they're being sedated and having multiple fillings placed or teeth removed. And then the permanent teeth come in and there's already damage because the enamel didn't form right or something happened there. You know, mm -hmm. that just, those are the people that really have some serious issues as they move into adulthood. So yeah. And I mean, it's, it just, it sounds like it's so cyclical almost where if there's some underlying issue that's going to affect your oral health and we know that your oral health is also going to affect your the rest body. of you too. Yes. So, you know, it can be really focusing on both of these things at the same time. That's really going to help you break from that cycle yep. and yep. improve that overall health, improve that oral health and just flourish. Right. And I wish I could give you a prescription, do A, B, and C, and you will mm -hmm. have no problems, but right. it's just not that way. Everyone is their own person. Everybody's got their own vulnerabilities, their own mm -hmm. strengths. And that's why it's so important for, you know, people to have a healthcare team. So to have a good Absolutely. biological dentist, to have a great naturopathic physician, you know, healthcare provider that can, we can work together to really help find the source of what is causing imbalance, addressing yeah. that, you know, absolutely. Those functional teams are pivotal to be able yep. to just even have that approach that everyone is so unique that yes. we need to dig into what is at the root cause for you specifically, because we yes. get people who come in, could be people who were exposed to the same thing, showing completely different symptoms exactly. or people who are exposed to completely different things but have very similar symptoms. There's really, you know, sometimes I, there's a very distinct connection, but a lot of times it's how your body, yes, how your body as an individual, as a unique person is going to react to things. Yes. And I have families where all the kids are different, you know, like mm -hmm. you have one, three kids that are doing great and one kid that has a whole bunch of oral health issues. So, right. and I'm sure you see that too with families <laughs> where you yeah, know, there's, yeah. there's two kids that just, no matter what you do, they just always seem to have a challenge or a, 
a block towards establishing I mean, healthy wellness. Dr. Carr, that, that is me out of my, me and my siblings, you know, my, mm -hmm. my sister, my brother grew up, no real big health concerns. I am the one who has autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. who has had these different hurdles. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful in the end for this right. because it's what led me to be who yes. I am and where I am today. Yes. But it is like just always a journey of saying, okay, so like what, what influenced my body yep. specifically and how can I overcome it? And so, you know, I think that just dentistry, oral health in general, always so important to yep. focus on. And like yep. you were saying, that relationship between oral health and all those underlying causes is always yep. something to look into. I agree. So, Let's get back to the dental materials just for a second, because I yes. do want to talk about crowns and implants real quick. And then I know you have a question, I think that- uh, I that do, one is I do. Here. Okay. So uh, we'll be sure to get to that, at least to kind of answer it on a surface level, if not more. Mm -hmm. But Another restoration that you're going to find in conventional dental offices are crowns. Okay. So a crown, a filling is like, there's a hole in a tooth, you clean it up and you, mm -hmm. it's like a pothole. You just fill that, that hole in and polish it. And that's what a filling is. A crown is when more than 50% of the tooth is involved with something. So it's either broken or it has a really big filling from a previous exposure to mm -hmm. cavity or something there. So it's basically a little, your tooth is like a little stub and there's a crown or a cap that's made to fit over the top of it. So conventional dentists will make a metal substructure to that crown. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they'll make this pretty glass porcelain overlay over the top of the metal. So these metals that are underneath, and these are called porcelain fused to metal crowns or PFMs. That's how they're referred to in the industry. Okay. These, these crowns that have this metal substructure are alloys again. So they're like your amalgam where they're multiple metals that are melted together or fused together. Mm -hmm. They don't have the heavy metals in them, but 90% of them have nickel in them, which we know there are as a huge percentage of the population that has sensitivities to nickel. Yeah. A lot of them have copper in them, which is an electrical conductor. And so there can be more of that galvanic sort of that electrical conductivity going on in these crowns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they have gold, silver, some of them even have palladium in them. So there's all sorts of and chromium. So there can be lots of different metals that are in these different types of metal crowns. Mm -hmm. So the heavy metal component isn't an issue, but these things corrode. So the metal oxides you're ingesting, and then they have this galvanic effect going on. I would say in about 75% of these metal crowns, when I remove them, there's dental amalgam underneath. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the dentist has left some of that silver filling to support the crown. So mm -hmm. now we have dental amalgam underneath sitting in close contact with that metal of the crown. And now you get a lot of release of that mercury. And remember the tooth is a two way street, right? So mm -hmm even though that's underneath the crown, you're absorbing that, that's getting right. into the tooth and into your body um, from underneath there. So mm -hmm. in our practice, obviously we don't place metal crowns, we remove a ton of metal crowns. Um, and again, we do that in a safe way. We're smart certified and have a big protocol, which again is on our website. Um, but we use all ceramic materials, which are metal free. Again, they're not perfect. They have some pigments and things mm -hmm. in them, which aren't, always compatible for everyone. But again, I think they're a step above the metals from, um, you know, from a health perspective. Right. right. Absolutely. And again, that's where we can have yes. someone like Dr. Rob step in and do that testing yes. to see how they're going to react to that material. Exactly. So before I jump into my question, I just want to make sure, yep. is there anything else that you wanted to say with the materials for now? So the only other thing would be dental implants. And this is again, a really big topic. And mm -hmm. so we can talk about this at a different time, but if someone loses a tooth, um, you know, there are different options that we can offer to replace that tooth if it's warranted. Um, so say somebody loses their front tooth, right? Yeah. That may yeah. be an issue. I mean, it's an right. issue anywhere, but that may be a, a significant issue for that person. 
So there are these um, options called dental implants, which are basically like a screw that goes into the jawbone, okay, like mm -hmm. the root of your tooth would. And then there's a little piece of it that comes and sticks through the gum tissue, like your tooth, the crown of your tooth would. And then one of those caps or crowns is made to fit over that whole implant system. Right. And it replaces the tooth, okay? Which is fantastic. And functionally, it's great. It's going to function just like your tooth. It's going to look very nice. Um, but we're implanting something foreign into your body, right? Mm -hmm. And there's two different options. One is titanium, which is basically what has been used in most orthopedic surgery. So if you think about knee replacements, hip replacements, mm -hmm you know, any break a bone, have a screw or a pin put in, that's all titanium. So it's the same stuff. It's medical grade titanium. But if you have other dental metals in your mouth or you're exposed to other metals in some way, we can start having some serious issues with that galv galvanism again. And then not mm -hmm. to mention you have titanium in your body, which can be an issue. So for some people, again, testing, right. To see yeah. how your body is responding. But, um, but the other option would be zirconia, which is a ceramic implant. And this, again, is a little bit more like this is the wave of the future. We're getting away from using the metals in the body. Not perfect. There's some limitations to it. But it is a nice option right now for people who get tested and can tolerate it. Um, mm -hmm. It is, I believe, a step above the, the traditional titanium implant. Yeah. Awesome that we yep. have more of these options now. Yes, so that's definitely. a topic that, like you were saying, big sounds one. like a big topic. Big Maybe one. we can touch on that another yeah. time. Yeah. Um, just as we wrap up today, like yep. I said, we had um, someone submit a question to us after yep. your last video. So she just said, and sorry, I'm going to read it. Yeah, um, I'd love information about helping kids who have crowded teeth slash narrow jaws. I've got one who is starting to lose teeth and there isn't much space for adult teeth and they already had a tongue tie released. Okay. So any, anything you can speak to about that? Yes. So again, this is a big topic, but let's mm -hmm. just kind of go glaze Brush across the surface. the surface and we can get back into this at a different time. So um, how the jaw develops, okay, and particularly we're talking about the upper jaw, okay, so kind of the part that's attached to the skull, all right, the mm -hmm. maxilla, that's what shapes kind of all of the mid-face development, so your airway, the size of your palate, okay, the roof of your mouth, the width of your upper jaw. The lower jaw will basically follow the upper, okay, so we're really focused on that upper jaw. So what shapes that? Okay, so why, why do some people have narrow jaws and some people have really wide jaws? Genetics comes into play, okay? So you look like your mom and dad. You know, mm -hmm. I look like my mom and dad. Um, same thing with whole body. We might have predispositions to different things. It doesn't mean we're going to express it, but we right. might have these predispositions to things. So genetics does play a part. But functional... Um, the ability for the muscles of the mouth to work optimally is what's really going to grow the upper jaw. And what I mean by that is the tongue. Okay. So if this is your floor of your mouth and this is your tongue, that tongue has to be able to lift. It has to be able to go backwards. It has to be able to get up to the roof of the mouth and seal. And it's the pressure of the tongue in the roof of the mouth that creates that expansion. Okay. It tells the bone where to go. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have a tongue, say it's tied, okay, that can't get up to the roof of the mouth or function appropriately, we're not going to get that signal for the bone to grow. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of kids have phrenectomies, right? So even as babies, if we're tongue tied or lip tied and the baby can't latch, it can't nurse, or there's a lot of colicky stuff or acid reflux stuff, airway issues, phrenectomy is absolutely the way to go, okay? But if the scar tissue forms right back where the initial, the initial connected tissue was, and I'm sorry if I'm not I'm kind of talking in dental terms. So if I need to right. break it down, I, let me know. I think, no, I think we can follow so far. <laughs> so um, if that scar tissue forms where the connected tissue originally was, you don't really have, you, the baby might be able to latch, okay? Mm -hmm. But you're still not getting that proper range of motion and right. function for the swallow and the tongue. 
So if the phrenectomy was done as a baby, a lot of times we need a second phrenectomy, okay? So when they're at a, a different stage in their growth and development, mm -hmm. a revision may be needed to that original phrenectomy. But the most important thing is how do we get, so if we've established coping mechanisms for swallowing, okay, and for using our tongue, how do we get it? So we're doing things the right way so we can grow the upper jaw. And that's myofunctional therapy. So there are oral myologists that are specialized in helping the child learn how to use their tongue and use the muscles mm -hmm. of the face um, appropriately so that that tongue is going where it needs to go and we're developing the upper jaw and the airway in a way that is going to be more optimal for the child. So okay, when I see somebody like that, okay, you know, what I usually find is that the, the phrenectomy was done early, okay, there was no myofunctional therapy, maybe the, the parent tried to manipulate the tongue a little bit after the surgery, um, and the child has just developed a typical swallow pattern, or they cannot physiologically get their tongue in the right position, and so the, the jaw is not going to expand. Now, there are cases where the teeth are too big, not too big, the jaw is too small, the mm -hmm. teeth are the right size, but they look too big for the jaw, um, you know, and early interceptive orthodontics is key with myofunctional therapy. So what I mean by that is expanders, okay, so something yeah. physical in there to get that jaw growing, but at the same time, making sure we have proper muscle function um, at the same time. Yeah. So what I would do is I would refer out. That's not something I do in my practice, but I'm an expert at identifying it. And I have great resources to get people connected so that they can get the proper treatment at the right stage of development. So we don't end up having to pull permanent teeth or having other issues. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for all of that information. Yeah. I hope that that is really helpful to the patient who submitted that question. I yeah. think she'll find that valuable. So perfect. Yeah, I think we're kind of at our time for today. Yeah, but again, thank sense. you so much for allowing me to connect with you and share this information with our, our, with our patients. Um, just a heads up, our next video, we will be talking a little bit more about food yes. and, and um, oral health. So make sure to stay tuned for that. Um, but again, it was great talking to you, Dr. Carr, and we will be seeing you again soon. All right. That sounds great. Thanks a million. See yep. you next time. Yep. Bye-bye.